On a Monday morning, June 13, 1983, Gregory Scott Traver made a panicked call to the Houston police. This call started something big and scary in Houston's history. Police went to an apartment in northeast Houston, Texas. What they found there was shocking. There were two bodies hurt really bad with a pickaxe. This was just the start of a case that everyone would talk about. Who could do such a terrible thing? Why would they do it? We're going to look into the scary story of Carla Faye Tucker. This is not just a story. We're taking you into something really dark. Let's find out together the truth behind what happened with Carla Faye Tucker. The crime scene. That morning, Gregory Scott Traver thought it was just another day. But what he found at his friend Jerry Dean's place started one of the most talked about crime stories in Houston. Traver was waiting for Dean to pick him up for work. When Dean didn't show, Traver went to check on him, thinking maybe he slept in. But what he found at Dean's apartment was shocking. The door was a bit open, which was strange. Inside, things were a mess. The TV and stereo were stacked up weirdly, and Jerry's beloved Harley Davidson bike was gone. Traver felt something was very wrong. He called for Jerry, but got no answer. Then, in a back room, he found a terrible sight. Jerry Dean was on the floor, not moving, in a lot of blood. Next to him on the bed was a woman Traver didn't know. She was also gone, with a pickaxe stuck in her chest. Traver was really scared. He ran home and called the police right away. The Houston police came and saw the chaos. The place looked like there had been a fight. In the back room, they found Jerry Dean and the unknown woman. Both had been attacked in a very violent way. The pickaxe, still in the woman's chest, showed just how awful the attack was. The police started digging into what happened by talking to Trevor. He told them about the creepy scene he found. He said it looked like someone had robbed the place, pointing out the missing bike and Jerry's blue Chevrolet El Camino truck. When they looked closer, they saw the victim's wallets were gone too and it looked like a hammer from Jerry's toolbox was used in the attack. At first, the cops thought it might be a robbery that got out of hand. But the way it was done seemed too mean, like it was personal. The more the investigators looked at the crime scene, the more they felt it was really serious. It didn't seem like just a break-in. It was more like someone had planned to hurt the victims badly. There were no signs of forced entry, which made them think the attacker knew the victims or the door was left open. But the way it was done, so harsh, made them think there was a deeper, more personal reason behind it. This was just the start of a big investigation that would lead them to Carla Faye Tucker. Her part in the story was as surprising as it was scary. Backgrounds and personalities. In 1983, Houston was a bustling city with over 2.3 million people, famous for its cultural mix and the NASA Johnson Space Center. But there was a darker side to Houston too. It had one of the highest crime rates in the US. It was in this city that the paths of Jerry Dean, Deborah Ruth Thornton, and Carla Faye Tucker tragically crossed. Jerry Dean, 27 years old when he died, wasn't a famous guy. He was known locally for being a good mechanic. People saw him as reliable, and he rarely missed work. But Jerry's life was a bit complicated. He was connected to Houston's nightlife, a detail that would become important in the investigation. Deborah Ruth Thornton, the other victim, was 32. She seemed to have an ordinary life. She was married with two kids, just like many in suburban Houston. But her marriage was in trouble, full of arguments and problems. This part of her life, usually hidden from others, would later become key in figuring out why this awful crime happened. Carla Faye Tucker was right at the heart of this complicated case. Her life was tough right from the start. As a kid, she got mixed up with drugs because of the rough environment she was in. Carla's tough times didn't stop as she got older, she got married, but it was full of fights and didn't last long. After her marriage fell apart, she went back to the rough life she knew before. Getting back into Houston's underground world, she got involved in things that would end up changing her life forever. As the police looked more into what happened, they saw how the lives of Carla, Jerry Dean, and Deborah Ruth Thornton were all connected. This case was about the dark sides of people, and the hard things going on in Houston at that time. The police were finding out a story that was about more than just what happened. It showed the struggles and sad things that the people involved went through. Investigation and leads. After finding the terrible scene at Jerry Dean's apartment, the Houston police got to work on a very careful investigation. They started thinking it might have been a robbery that got out of control. This made sense because the apartment was a mess and things like Jerry's Harley-Davidson and Chevrolet El Camino were missing. 
but the really mean way the murders were done made the cops think it might be something more personal. The cops first looked at people close to Jerry and Deborah Ruth Thornton. Jerry knew lots of people from Houston's nightlife, but none of them seemed to have a reason to do something this bad. They also looked at Deborah's life, especially her tough marriage. Her husband, Richard Thornton, was a suspect at first because they had been fighting a lot, but he had a strong alibi for the night of the murders, so he was no longer a suspect. Then the police thought about other ideas. Maybe someone had a problem with Jerry or Deborah, or it could have been a random attack by a stranger. But as they kept looking, they didn't find anything to back up these ideas. It was a puzzle. They couldn't find a reason or a chance for the crime to happen. Every way they looked seemed to lead nowhere. The big break in the case came when the police started looking at Carla Faye Tucker and her friend, Daniel Garrett. Carla was known to hang out in the same places as Jerry Dean, and she became interesting to the investigation because of her rocky past and her bad feelings towards Jerry. The cops found out that Carla and Jerry had problems because of Jerry's relationship with Carla's best friend, Sean. This was a new clue for the police, pointing to a reason for the crime that was more about personal revenge than a robbery. Daniel Garrett, who was with Carla, also became a key part of the investigation. Garrett worked as a bartender and was around the same people as Jerry and Carla. He had his own past dealings with the victims. The ties between Carla and Daniel, their connections to Jerry and Deborah, and the tensions that were there gave the police a strong new lead to follow. As the investigation went on, the police kept finding more evidence and putting together what happened that night. It started to look more and more like Carla Faye Tucker and Daniel Garrett were involved. Their pasts and how they knew the victims started to show a crime that came out of hard feelings and personal problems. Carla Faye Tucker's life. The investigation into the murders of Jerry Dean and Deborah Ruth Thornton brought Carla Faye Tucker into the spotlight, revealing her deeply troubled life story. Born on November 18, 1959, Tucker's life was a rough journey from the start. Her childhood wasn't happy or stable, which led to a hard time as a teenager and adult. Carla's early life was full of problems. Her mom, who used drugs, got Carla started on drugs when she was just eight years old. This started a long battle with addiction that took over most of her life. By the age of 12, she was already deep into drug use, far away from a normal childhood. Starting drugs and getting into sex at such a young age was a sign of the hard times she would have when she got older. Because her home life was so unstable, Carla left school when she was only 14. She ended up in Houston's underground scene, doing the same things her mom and sisters did. She got into sex work, which made her even more stuck in a life of drugs and crime. Being around biker gangs, she started using even worse drugs like heroin. These early years show a young woman trapped in a cycle of addiction and being taken advantage of, with little chance of getting out of it. Carla's relationship with Jerry Dean was tense and full of bad feelings, even though they weren't romantically involved. Their paths crossed because of Jerry's relationship with Sean, who was Carla's best friend and roommate. Over time, Carla and Jerry really started to dislike each other. Their views on each other got worse, turning into serious hostility. This bad relationship would later become an important part of the investigation into the murders. Why Carla got involved in Jerry Dean's murder was complicated. She had grown to really hate him over time. What happened that night was the result of a bunch of personal fights and problems that were never solved. Carla's rough past, filled with abuse, addiction and bad choices, played a big role in how she thought and led her to a path of violence and revenge. As the police looked more into Carla's life, they found a lot of complicated relationships and events. This showed a disturbing picture of a woman pushed to the edge. Her history with Jerry Dean, her drug problems and her connections to the criminal world in Houston all added up to a story that was both complex and sad. The investigation was uncovering more about Carla Faye Tucker's life, showing a story that was as much about how society failed as it was about the crimes she did. Unraveling the truth. The investigation took a big turn when Doug Garrett, the brother of Daniel Garrett, who was with Carla Faye Tucker, got involved. Doug's information was key to figuring out what really happened in the crime. At first, Doug didn't want to get involved, but he knew something important, and it was hard to keep it to himself. He finally told the police something that changed everything. He said that right after the murders, Carla and Danny came to his house in Jerry Dean's stolen blue El Camino. Carla talked about the killings without feeling sorry at all, and she knew details that only someone who was there would know. This was the first real proof that Carla and Danny were part of the murders. 
With this new information, the Houston police decided to try something undercover. They set up a secret operation with Doug Garrett. He agreed to wear a hidden microphone and talk to Carla and Danny about the murders. This was a big risk for the police. They were hoping that Carla and Danny would say something that would prove they did it, and they would record it. The undercover operation worked out well. In a conversation that the police recorded, Carla and Danny ended up talking about what happened on the night of the murders. They didn't realize they were giving away their part in the horrible crime. The recordings caught Carla describing what happened in Jerry Dean's apartment in a very clear and shocking way. Her words gave a very graphic and awful picture of the violence. With these recordings, the police quickly arrested Tucker and Daniel Garrett. The things they said in the undercover operation were the final pieces the police needed to make their case strong. Arresting Carla and Danny was a big moment in the investigation. It went from being about figuring out motives and suspicions to being a clear case of really bad murder. The confessions they got, along with what Doug Garrett had said earlier, were crucial in proving that Carla and Danny were guilty. The way they talked about the murders, without any sorrow and with a lot of detail, showed how they were thinking. The police had managed to find out the truth behind the two murders. They showed a crime that was filled with hate and done in a very cruel way. Catching Tucker and Daniel Garrett gave some closure to the case, but it also started a new part in court. This part would look into the complicated and sad lives of Carla and Danny and what led them to do such a terrible thing. Trial and Conviction The trial of Carla Faye Tucker and Daniel Garrett drew a lot of attention from both Houston and the whole country. The court heard all the grim details about the murders of Jerry Dean and Deborah Ruth Thornton. The trial carefully laid out all the evidence, witness stories and legal arguments showing clearly what happened before and after the terrible crime. The prosecutors did a very thorough job. They based their case on solid evidence, people who saw things, and the confessions they got from the undercover operation. The jury heard about the awful details of the crime scene, like the pickaxe used in the murders. This was a strong reminder of just how bad the crime was. Forensic evidence linked both Tucker and Garrett to the scene, making their case even stronger. The prosecutors talked a lot about how they used forensics in the case, they found fingerprints at the scene that matched Tucker and Garrett, proving they were there when the crime happened. They also used advanced techniques to look at blood patterns which helped them figure out what happened in the apartment during the attack. Experts talked about the specific marks on the victim's bodies showing they were from the pickaxe. This pickaxe was looked at very closely for DNA. The forensic team's work went even further using hair and fiber analysis. They found fibers and hair that matched Tucker and Garrett at the crime scene. This use of modern forensic technology was key in showing in detail how Tucker and Garrett were involved in the crime. This evidence, along with the testimonies and confessions, made a strong case that left little doubt about their guilt. A big moment in the trial was when key witnesses spoke. Doug Garrett, whose information had been vital, talked about the confessions made by his brother and Carla. He gave a direct account of Carla's detailed story of the murder. Other witnesses like Freens and people who knew Tucker and Garrett described how their relationships were unstable and how tensions were building up before the murders. One important witness was Sean Dean, Jerry Dean's ex-wife and a former close friend of Tucker. Her words helped the court understand the troubled relationship between Tucker, Garrett and Jerry Dean. She talked about their history of fights and aggression. Sean's view of how they interacted gave important information about why the crime might have happened. The trial also featured a forensic expert who went into great detail about the physical evidence from the crime scene. This expert gave a scientific view that backed up the story of Tucker and Garrett being part of the murders. The analysis of the murder weapon, the pickaxe, and how it was used was both very technical and unsettling. Police officers who were the first to get to the crime scene also spoke. They described what the apartment and the victims looked like right after the murders. Their stories helped give the jury a full picture of the crime. A neighbor was another witness. They talked about strange things they heard and saw the night of the murders. This helped make a timeline and showed how the events happened before the bodies were found. There was also a prisoner who had talked to Tucker when she was in jail. This person said Tucker seemed sorry and talked about details of the crime. This added to the story, showing what Tucker was thinking after she was arrested. The witnesses in the trial each brought a different view which really helped make a strong case against Tucker and Garrett. Their stories ranged from personal experiences to forensic details. 
all showing a crime that was planned and really harsh. This left a big mark on the jury. The defense tried to lessen the effect of the evidence against Tucker and Garrett. They questioned how true the confessions were and whether the witnesses could be trusted. They also talked a lot about the tough lives Tucker and Garrett had, with a lot of drug use and unstable childhoods to explain why they did what they did. The defense had experts in psychology and drug problems talk about how Tucker and Garrett's hard lives and constant drug use affected their thinking and ability to know right from wrong. These experts said that growing up around violence, drugs and emotional problems had a big impact on what they did on the night of the murders. The defense also brought in people who knew Tucker and Garrett well. These people talked about their battles with addiction and their efforts to find some stability in their lives. This was meant to make Tucker and Garrett seem more human, showing them as people shaped by their tough situations and things they couldn't control. The defense tried to make the jury doubt the prosecution's evidence. They questioned how the confessions were gotten, suggesting they might have been forced or manipulated. They also pointed out any inconsistencies in what the prosecution's witnesses said. They even challenged the way the forensic evidence was collected and interpreted. An important part of the defense was showing how Tucker had changed while in jail. Witnesses from the prison, including other prisoners and chaplains, talked about her becoming religious and having a good influence on others in prison. This was meant to show that Tucker could change and be better, and that she wasn't the same person who did the murders. The defense tried to make the jury feel empathy and understand Tucker and Garrett. They wanted the jury to think about their whole lives and what led to their actions. Their goal was to change the story from just a cold murder to a sad result of abuse and addiction. By making Tucker and Garrett seem more like real people, the defense hoped the jury would be more likely to give them a less harsh sentence. They wanted to show how complicated the case and the people in it were, but in the end, the evidence against them was just too strong. After a trial that showed the worst parts of human behavior, the jury decided. Carla Faye Tucker and Daniel Garrett were found guilty of the terrible crimes they were charged with. This verdict was the end of a trial that was complex, emotional, and got a lot of attention from people everywhere. The sentencing part of the trial was just as tense as the trial itself. Tucker and Garrett were facing the death penalty, and that's what they both got in the end. When Tucker was sentenced to death, it was a big deal because not many women in Texas had gotten that sentence before. This decision had a big impact both inside and outside the courtroom. It made people talk a lot about the death penalty, what justice really means, and if people can really change. The trial and guilty verdicts for Tucker and Daniel Garrett closed a chapter on a case that had really upset and shocked the community, but it also started a lot of deep talks about how the criminal justice system works, what punishment should be like, and if people can change. The story of Carla Faye Tucker, especially, kept getting attention and making people feel different ways about it in the years after the trial. Carla's transformation in prison and Tucker's time in prison marked a big change in her life. She went from being a convicted murderer to someone who went through a big spiritual change. This transformation became a big part of her story and got a lot of people interested in talking. When Tucker first got to prison, she acted like she had in the past. Tough, not sorry and like she didn't really care about what she had done. But as time went on, and she started to really understand what her sentence meant and what she had done, she began to change. The early years of her time in jail were when she really started to become a different person. The big thing that changed Tucker was finding religion. In her prison cell, she turned to the Bible, which was surprising, since she hadn't cared about it before. She started going to religious services and Bible study groups in prison. Little by little, she left behind her old self and started living a life focused on faith and thinking deeply about things. Tucker's turn to religion changed how she acted, too. The woman who used to be tough and troubled turned into a symbol of peace and change for the better. People in the prison, like the staff, other prisoners and volunteers from religious groups, all saw this change in her. She got really involved in the prison's religious programs sharing her story and new faith with others and trying to help other prisoners find their own way to change. When people outside of prison heard about how Tucker had changed, it made a lot of different feelings and thoughts come up. Her case became a big part of discussions about what justice really means if people can truly change and whether the death penalty is right or wrong. Some people saw her story as a powerful example of how faith can change someone, even when it seems very unlikely, 
but other people thought she was just pretending to be different to try to get out of facing the consequences of the terrible things she had done. Debate over capital punishment. The Carla Fay Tucker case really brought the death penalty into the spotlight, stirring up a lot of strong opinions and discussions from all kinds of people. Tucker's change in prison and her upcoming execution became a big thing for the whole country to talk about when it comes to the rights and wrongs of the death penalty. Some people were for Tucker being executed. They believed the death penalty was a key part of justice, acting as a way to stop crimes and as payback for very bad crimes. In their eyes, Tucker's case was clear. Her awful role in the murders of Jerry Dean and Deborah Ruth Thornton meant she deserved the most severe punishment. This view was especially strong with the families of the victims and their supporters. They saw the execution as a way to close this chapter and as justice for the loss that could never be fixed. They thought that even if Tucker had really changed, it didn't make up for how serious her crimes were or the pain she caused the victims and their families. But there were also many people against Tucker being executed. This group got bigger and more noticed as more people heard about how Tucker had changed. It included religious leaders, people fighting for human rights, and even some conservative politicians. They thought Tucker's case was a strong reason to be against the death penalty. They said her new way of life and her turning to religion showed that people can change. Even after doing really bad things, they believed that executing Tucker would be a lack of mercy and a failure to see that people can get better and that every life has value. The discussion about what should happen to Carla Faye Tucker caught the attention of some well-known people, which made the debate even bigger. Important religious leaders like Pope John Paul II and big political names spoke up for her, saying her sentence should be changed to life in prison instead of death. These powerful voices made the debate go international, showing how different parts of the world see the death penalty differently than the United States. In this intense debate, people really looked at whether the death penalty was a fair and effective way to punish someone. Those who wanted Tucker to be executed said it was about justice and following the law. They believed the awfulness of her crimes made the death penalty the right choice. On the other side, people against her execution talked about the moral problems with taking a life, the chance for people to change, and the risk of executing someone who didn't do the crime. They used these points to argue that the death penalty should be stopped or at least thought about again. Tucker's case became a central part of the bigger discussion about the death penalty. It showed how deeply divided people are and how complex the morals are around this issue. The arguments about whether she should be executed or not touched on big questions about what justice means, what's right and wrong, and what role the government should have in punishing people. As the date for her execution got closer, these debates got more intense, making Tucker's case a symbol of the ongoing national conversation about what the future of the death penalty should be in America. Execution and Aftermath in the days leading up to her execution, Tucker was surprisingly calm, even with all the media attention and public debates about her case. Her peaceful attitude came from the big change in her beliefs while in prison. She talked to the media a lot, saying she was sorry for what she did and talking about her faith. The whole world was watching as her execution got closer, with live TV and constant news updates. On the day she was to be executed, February 2, 1998, a lot of different people gathered outside the Texas State Prison. Some were for the death penalty, believing it was the right punishment for Tucker's terrible crimes. Others were strongly against it, seeing Tucker as a symbol of someone who could change and be better. This split in the crowd showed how the whole country felt, still arguing about whether the death penalty is right or wrong. Tucker's last hours were spent talking to spiritual advisors and saying goodbye to her family and friends. Her choice for a last meal was simple, matching the new person she had become. When the time came for her execution, Tucker stayed calm, which was very different from the emotional scenes happening outside the prison. After Carla Faye Tucker was executed, there was a big increase in discussions about the death penalty and its place in today's justice system. Her case became a key example in debates about whether prisoners can really change, if the death penalty stops crimes from happening, and if it's right to execute someone who has changed a lot as a person. In the time after her execution, Tucker's story kept making people talk about how prisons should be run. Her case brought up questions about how well prisons help prisoners change and get ready to go back to society. Tucker's execution also made people think more about how women are treated in the criminal justice system 
especially those who are sentenced to death. Her case led to more looking into whether there are biases in how men and women are sentenced and executed, adding to the bigger conversation about equality and fairness in the death penalty. So Tucker's execution left a big mark. It wasn't just about her case. It sparked a lot of thinking and talking about the death penalty, how prison should work, how gender is treated in the justice system, and what punishment and change really mean in our society. Her story kept having an effect on legal discussions, policies, and what people think, even long after she was gone. As we finish the story of Carla Faye Tucker, it leaves us with big questions. When justice is done, can it really take into account how much a person has changed? In the shadows of the law, where does the line between retribution and redemption blur?